Hey everybody, uh, sorry, uh, I thought the music was playing, I was trying to figure out that. I'm using a new system so I can do things like uh, share my screen and play videos for y'all when we do this too, so it's a little bit more interactive. Uh, but welcome uh, to this week's Griscom stream. I'm broadcasting uh, to y'all live from a very, very stormy Austin, Texas. Hope that you have some nice weather wherever you are out there. Um, and welcome. I mean, uh, it already looks like folks are in the chat and ready to go. So no reason to, to dance around. But um, for folks who are new, you know, these are a little bit more uh, casual. So feel free to jump in with questions in chat. Um, definitely some stuff we're going to be talking about uh, regarding Palestine and uh, also the title of the video. Uh, what happens when socialists uh, fail labor? Because uh, I think that's some some really important topics. But I'm also curious about what you all are thinking about. Uh, so feel free to jump into the uh, the chat with questions. And of course, we always appreciate Super Chats. Um, is the audio not working for y'all? Hmm. Yeah, no, you guys are hearing me. Okay, that's good. But let me know if there's any uh, issues because I was having a problem playing music before uh, we got started. Um. <laughs> Well, I'll get to that in one second, uh, VM, because uh, I think that's a big, a big question. What we're sort of here to talk about today. Uh, okay, audio is good. Um, I remember last week I was going on for a little while and uh, nobody was on the other end. So, anyways, let's stop all the yelling. Um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Palestine. Let's talk about what's going on here. And I wanted to start um, by saying that. This is one of those things that really does tick me off the way that a lot of Americans um, sort of sort politics into two different camps uh, when they say things like domestic policy and foreign policy, right? And obviously, there's logic behind why we would do that as some methods of analysis and way to think about things, right? Just being able to, to separate things out, things out helps us understand um, and, and focus on certain things, right? But what I don't like about the way that people sort of separate politics, like foreign policy in the U.S. from domestic policy, um, is that it makes foreign policy sort of like so abstract that people act like um, whether or not the United States should be sending three point eight billion dollars to a you know to a regime that is not only implementing a system of apartheid, um, but actually forcing. Um, ethnic cleansing um, and extreme uses of violence against civilians, right? This is not something that you can abstract away from politics. This is not something that you can abstract away from our role as Americans in this system, right? We can recognize our weakness and all that kind of stuff and understand how we, what we need to do to win, right? How to create pressure campaigns that can work, all that, yes. But you can't just treat these things as if they're abstract questions, right? To sort of ponder like, oh, what would the good American foreign policy be? This is something that is actively happening in the world around all of us. And creating these lines um, is extremely harmful, especially uh, when it comes to uh, Palestine. Because this is one of those things, uh, while the United States is very much involved around the world, um, supporting horrific uh, regimes. This is one where the U.S. hand is extremely clear and it's very present. Um, you know, there is such a feedback loop from, um, you know, in Israel uh, from what's happening in the United States. There's a reason that a lot of money is spent lobbying Americans and American politicians because American financial support of apartheid in Israel is critical for that system to co co continuation. Um, and as we said earlier, you know, we're talking significant amounts of money. Um, you know, it's $3.8 billion. This is not just some small political question, right? And obviously it goes beyond just being a budgetary question to like a human rights question. And we'll get to some of this stuff um, that's been happening, um, you know, this week because it's really horrific. Um, I just wanted to, to note this that Patrick Stevens says, it's times like this where I remember Angela Davis telling us that Israel trains so many U.S. police departments. Um, and our military gives them excess equipment. There is a direct line uh, between, you know, systems of apartheid, um, systems of over-policing, um, you know, that goes into and out of Israel. It's not that, that you know, the system there is the source of um, all of those things. 
Um, but there is no doubt that, you know, when we the line I think is best to think about it is, is this, is that, you know, the Palestinian struggle is all of our struggle um, in the sense that to, def- to uh, you know, to get liberty and, and dignity for the Palestinian people, it's going to require a continuation of the worldwide uh, struggle. And also a good way to do that is for people to understand um, that these lines, these systems of, of colonization um, and, and capitalism and, and apartheid and over-policing um, very much are, are felt by certain populations in the United States, uh, many populations in the United States, um, as they are in Israel, and, understand, you know, and, and as they're felt by Palestinians. And like understanding that line, I think, is really critical. Um, I think so, too. But let's see here, because um, I wanted to, to just sort of set the stage a little bit. I mean, I'm sure people who are watching this are familiar, and this isn't going to be a news breakdown uh, stream, um, you know, are familiar, though, with what has been been going on. And uh, before we get to some of this, you know, newer media stuff that I have, I wanted to really make sure that people um, are understanding, at least generally, what's happening. You know, in Gaza alone, there's been 26 deaths so far, nine of those being children. And and, and, and really let that soak in because there's some, one of those moments that, you know, can happen when you're introducing these things that we go over the numbers first and, and it sort of robs the, the humanity of the situation, right? Because it becomes a, you know, factual conversation instead of a human conversation about the fact that people are dying right now in, in, in one of these most asymmetrical conflicts. Um, and um, I'm sure people have seen, you know, a lot of the media criticism, and I think that's really important, and we'll certainly do that, that here today um, as well. Um, but it's just really important to, to not, like, look, we're, we've got to think about the politics, we've got to think about what we can do, but to not lose that, that humanity of, of, of this crisis because um, it becomes so easy to abstract this, this pain. Um, and, 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 and it's really, really real. And so much of our media system in the United States um, works to try to deflect um, the very clear asymm- asymmetry in power um, and also asymmetry in horror um, between what the Palestinians are experiencing and what Israeli settlers are doing, right? I mean, we talk about the passive voice in the New York Times. Um, you know how, I mean, I'm sure people on Twitter have been seeing all of these uh, rewrites of New York Times headlines where they really tried to make it seem like, oh, this stuff is just happening and it's not caused by anybody. Um, yeah, clashes between protesters. Um, and you see it too, you know, when you get this both sidism, right? When people are like, I condemn all the violence. And we'll get to a great example of the United States government doing that. But again, I just want to, one of my favorite uh, poets is uh, Marud Bargadi, who is an incredible Palestinian poet. And he has, um, in, in, in one of his, his books, he has this line that always, always like really sat with me, is that you know, so much of the way that you know, people write and think about Palestinians, even people who are supportive of them, um, sort of robs them of the, the fullness of, of their lives. It's like we're more than just statistics. You know, these, are, these are real people, and I think it's important to always try to, to, uh, to ground that as well, too. Um, but, you know, these, these deaths are happening in the context of widespread terror and intimidation as Israel and, and its settlers are pushing forward with evictions of Palestinian people. Uh, we've seen the raids on the mosque. Um, it's absolutely devastating. Uh, we've seen the increase of, of violence in one of the holiest parts of the year um, against Palestinian people. And remember, this is all... This is terror and it's evil, but it's for a very specific goal, which is the continuation of the ethnic cleansing of of Palestine. It's the same kind of tactics um, that happened in the tragedy um, where, you know, the Israeli army was implement Israeli army and and settlers were were conducting horrific um, atrocities on people, not just to punish them and to attack them, but to basically make anyone else who is in the area know that they have to leave or they are in danger, right? And this is a continuation of that, right? So the push here that we're seeing, and there's no doubt about it that the right-wing violence that we were seeing going into this sort of explosion lately, um, 
is 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 very much driven to elicit a response from Palestinians so then Netanyahu and the pro settler forces can justify um you know can can justify an increase in violence and to continue to force people out of their homes um the asymmetry is clear we're talking about rockets versus airplanes um i'll, I'll pull this up for uh for everybody because it's important too uh, just give me one moment um this is just one of the more horrific examples of of, of what's happening right now um let me get it here there we go did my mic okay my mic's still good um the moment the bombing uh, the Hanadi Tower west of Gaza City by warplanes. And this stuff, um, you know, this is a 14-story residential tower. Now, from what I've, I've found, it had been evacuated beforehand. This is people's homes, and this is asymmetric warfare. Um, and it's, it's really despicable to see people continue to try to make a false equivalence um, from warplanes there and and hamas sending out uh, rockets this isn't going to be a full conversation on you know all the politics of, of israel uh palestine um but it's 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 absurd to sit here and even compare um rockets being fired um to 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 actually blowing up and flying warplanes into residential and civilian occupied areas to bomb them i mean it's absolutely disgusting um and there's more and more and more, um, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like this is, you know, going to, to settle down anytime soon. Um, I'm sure since I've been live, um, you know, or even since I was preparing for, for today, like more and more has been happening. Um, right. But you get this, the, the rockets and the airplanes, stones versus guns. I mean, there's this fixation of trying to show any kind of Palestinian standing up for themselves. Um, which is it's just absurd to deny people the right of self-defense when what is happening is so, so clear. But you won't see that um, in, in the U.S. media um, for the most part. And whenever anybody does speak truthfully about what's happening there, there are incredible um, response rates from U.S. Empire to silence folks. You know, and... I want to talk, I want to focus on the, the U.S. stuff in a second, but um, we'll try to find some ways on, on Thursday's show to, to uh, you know, encourage people to be able to donate and show solidarity um, and things of that nature. But I wanted to talk about this a little bit because um, um, I wanted to talk. OK, thank you all uh, for the audio points. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the Palestine issue, because it's one thing is I was doing a little bit of self-criticism, um, you know, over the weekend um, and realizing we don't talk a lot about it on the show. Um, and, and that's not because we don't take it, it, it seriously. It's, uh, you know, for me, uh, fighting for, for Palestine, standing up for Palestine was very important in my early political journey. I remember at school I was in, you know, Students for Justice in Palestine, and that was uh, not only like a great introduction into, you know, anti-imperialist thought, um, but also a lot of socialist and left-wing um, thought as, as well. And for me, I just assume that if you're on the left, that, uh, you know, you understand that Israel is an apartheid state. Um, but I, I realize that it's, it's important to continue to, to, to talk about this as, as much as possible, because even if, if within like left-wing socialist communities, people think that, and it's, again, it's not even 100%. Um, so that's something, and you know, that's a big fight, for example, in organizations like DSA to make you know, these things big parts um, of, of their platform. Um, but I think it's, also, it's really important because when we have moments like what's been happening over this past week and a half, um, you get reminded really quickly at just how effective the media blockade is against Palestinians um, and how strong the pro-Israel lobby is in the United States um, from, you know, Greta, um, you know, having to combat, you know, after saying that she was horrified by what she's seeing in Gaza um, and, and Jerusalem, um, you know, having to walk that back and say, oh, by that, I'm not taking sides. Um, I mean, come on, it's, it's clear who's doing what and it's clear what side to be on if you are against 
um, massacres of people, if you are against continued colonization um, and ethnic cl- cleansing. It's just like this is one of those things where there is not um, – there's a lot of things when it comes to you know figuring out uh, solutions and, and the best way to support the struggle and things like that that are, are nuanced and you know difficult conversations. But as a like a general orientation to this question, um, it's very clear – who the occupiers are and who the occupied is. It's very clear who the people who have been forced out of their homes, not just over the past few months and years, um, but over decades and decades and decades now. You know, it's very clear um, that, that, you know, as the video that, you know, a lot of people were sharing last week of, you know, this this settler um, with a very, <laughs> um, you know, pure Brooklyn accent. It's absurd that he can go and, 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 and occupy someone else's home um, in, in Palestine, and yet American uh, Palestinians aren't allowed to even return to their, their homeland. I mean, it's, it's clear where um, the, the weight of these things uh, should go. And it's, what's been happening this week has just served as a reminder how strong the media blockades are on these things. Because a lot of folks, um, uh, a lot of folks, uh, you know, really don't get a lot of information, even people who are well-meaning and, and on the left, because it can be really confusing. There's a lot of people out there who are trying to uh, misinform you. Um, absolutely. Um, and, and Matt asks, uh, Greta, I, I was saying Greta uh, Thunberg. Um, well, let me put on this video, though, to sort of uh, do check out this time. I mean, obviously, and, and Dan asks a BDS, obviously support uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, there's, there's no doubt about it that there's a huge financial um, apparatus involved um, in the settler. Um, I mean, you, when you're occupying land, you're, you're taking over um, something that you can use for, for production and, and, and for commodity production. Um, there's a lot of things that can be um, targeted through that. And, and there's a reason that in the United States they spend so much time trying to outlaw BDS um, is because it is effective. It was effective uh, regarding South Africa. Um, and the continuation of the BDS campaign, um, you know, against against this settler colonial state is 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 crucial. Um, I think that there really at this point isn't too much more argument about it. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, I'll put on this video. This is the U.S. State Department. I'm sure some of y'all have seen this, but I want to talk about it a little bit because it's really absurd. We're speaking of the principle of self-defense. Uh, we no, certainly. I'm asking if you think that the principle of self-defense applies to the retaliatory the, 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 the airstrikes that they're conducting in uh, response. Matt, this to is a very fluid situation. I, w- I would hesitate to uh, comment on operations beyond you know the rocket fire that uh, is clearly targeting innocent civilians uh, in Israel. So I would hesitate to speak to specific operations um, that have just occurred. But the broader principle of self-defense is something. Um, we uh, uh, we stand by uh, on behalf of Israel yeah, and every other country. Do you think that a re- Israeli military response to the rockets coming in, it, it, that a, re- a military response to the rockets coming in is covered by this r- broader rubric of self-defense, right? Uh, self self-defense often does uh, uh, authorize the use of force. This, thank you, Matt. Uh, I want to ask you about East Jerusalem, but just talk about what you said about the principle of self-defense. Does that in any way apply to the Palestinians? Do they have a right to self-defense? Do Palestinians have a right to self-defense? Uh, I'm, in broadly speaking, Saeed, uh, we believe in the concept of self-defense. We believe it applies uh, to any state. I don't okay. think okay. that, uh, I, 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 I certainly wouldn't I, want uh, my words to be construed no, as- I understand. I, w- I want to ask you, I'm, I don't want to harp on this either, but you know, the Israelis killed 13 people just now, you know, including maybe five or six children. Do you condemn that? Do you ki- condemn the killing of children? <laughs> Said, uh, I, oh, I'm asking, do you condemn the killing of Palestinian children? Obviously, uh, and these reports are just emerging, uh, mm-hmm. and I understand. I was just speaking to the team. I understand we don't have independent comp- This goes on for a while, and um, you know, you can find the, the clip. It's, it's out there for everyone to see. Um, I just, uh, at a certain point, you can only take so much BS. And again, uh, you know, as we talk about... Um, with uh, Jen Psaki, uh, you know, Biden's you know, the White House press secretary. I mean, these people's jobs uh, is to lie and to obfuscate the truth, right? Um, but these State Department briefings, um, a lot more than White House uh, press briefings, actually 
um, do sometimes uh, bring out a little bit more uh, red meat or things of interest. Um, and it, it should just remind people of how, think about it, this is the, the United States, the State Department, the United States, which is supposed to re- you know, be a country, we all know you know the reality but this is you know the general consensus or the general like understanding of what the united states represents the united states represents a rules-based international system and democracy right and this jackass can't even condemn the the killing of children this he can't even condemn uh the (laughs) the continued um eviction of people from their homes he can't he, and, and you know he makes this point about you know the right of self-defense the right of self-defense um one um there is no symmetry again between rockets and stones and fighter jets i'm sorry it's just there's no reality where you can see the difference uh where you can't uh uh you know where you treat these things as equivalent right that's ridiculous um but beyond that he's talking about states and one thing that's very notable about Palestine um, is: do, do the Pal- does the Palestinian state have the right to self-defense? Right? I mean, in this case, the, the Palestinian state, in any kind of sense, um, is is completely in shambles, and that's by design because you can't have a state if you don't control your land. You can't have a state if you don't control your currency. You can't have a state if you don't control your borders. Right? Again, we'll t- we'll get some people on. We'll talk about a little bit more about the political scene on the ground there. But for folks who aren't familiar, you need to understand that Palestine effectively, um, you know, they they have like a nominal state, a nominal government, but they don't have any power. Right. And in that kind of vacuum, a lot of different forces try to coalesce uh, power. So when you're talking about an entire people, a people who have been thrown out of their land um, and then you start talking about the right of self-defense of Israel, the question always is going to have to be, what about the Palestinian people? And that very, very specific kind of like legal definition of the right of, of self-defense is very interesting for him to use there because he knows um, that by doing this, he is excluding uh, the Palestinian people. And, and, and this is the same thing. You know, people get confused. How does Israel, um, you know, how, how, do these, how do people come in and just occupy somebody's home? Well, if you are a Palestinian um, person, Right, in 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 the occupied territories, you effectively, uh, and especially in the territories where the, where the settlers um, are have been have been targeting um, very very boldly, you have a there's a legal system there that will completely ignore basic norms when it comes to rights for Palestinian people. That's how they get away with this kind of stuff. It, they use a, a court system that is extremely biased against Palestinians to embolden uh, settlers um, to do whatever they want. It's, it's horrific. You know, when, when people get, when Palestinians get stuck into the Israeli court system, uh, more often than not, they're going into military courts, which have something like a 99% uh, conviction rate. Um, and people are held for, for months and months on end and essentially coerced um, to, uh, um, they're essentially coerced into, you know, admitting guilt just because it will be faster for them to just serve a sentence uh, than to go through legal proceedings, right? The entire state, the entire state of Israel is set up at this point systematically to deny Palestinian people their basic, basic fundamental rights. Let alone, like, we're not even talking about, you know, land of dignity. We're talking about just basic rights that you would expect any functioning, not even democracy, just any kind of functioning system that has, you know, any legitimacy um, or any sense of, you know, legal rules for people. It's, it's, it's a joke. But again, this is the United States government doing this. This is the United States government unable to see, to describe a situation clearly. Unable, cowardly. To, I mean, think about that. Somebody is asking you if you condemn the murdering of children, if you condemn uh, warplanes bombing civilian areas, do you condemn that? And you have to come up with a legalistic answer, right? An around, a, a roundabout answer um, to that question. <laughs> if, you know, there, if you have any questions of morality there, it should, it's, it's very clear. Um, you know what's going on uh, that, that that if you're unable to answer point blank questions like that 
you're 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 supporting an evil evil an evil system <sighs> we'll do some um we'll do some more on this soon um it's it's uh it's it's truly um a horrific situation solidarity with palestinian people um all over the world and you know we i believe strongly in your right to return um it's 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 a and there's so you know there's a lot of history um you know to to go through and i know it's these things aren't covered um so it can be hard to know where to start these conversations with with each other um so we'll try to do a little bit more of that on on left reckoning over the next few weeks um but it's 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 one of those situations where it's so so very very clear. All right, y'all, um, and you know it's so amazing too. United States, this is a country where we celebrate, <laughs> um, you know, the American Revolution, where a bunch of people who were fed up with taxes um, and and a financial system and a, a democrat and, and a system where they didn't feel like they were getting you know even take like the the traditional understanding of what the American Revolution was about, right? taxation without representation you know we're not getting a say in our system you know a country that celebrates this every year and understands this to be like our founding values are spreading democracy and freedom from oppressive occupying governments right regardless of that founding story is true or not like just understand that in the american mythos if the american understanding of ourselves as a country right um, you know, the heroes that were taught, this is, these are people we want our children to be like, like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Again, uh, you know, not, um, you know, again, we know the actual story of these people, but like an American society that tells people, look up to those folks. We want you to be like them. Right. And then in the same breath, uh, condemns Palestinian people who have only seen in a very short period of time, uh, their, <laughs> their entire, um, you know, community and, and world be completely um, forced out, seeing having families being split. I mean, people need to understand how hard these borders are, that you have families, some families have been forced out into exile forever, and they can't get back. They can't get back to their, their homeland. So even if they do have family that wasn't completely thrown out um, of, of, their, of their town or village, the families can't get together, Right. Um, anyway, you know, to, for Americans to sit here um, and and not understand the Palestinian struggle, given, you know, a kind of propensity um, in our history and like our, our mythology about being, you know, freedom fighters and people who understand what it's like to stand up against an oppressive government. Um, it's, it's just it's absurd. And obviously there's reasons for that. It's because, um, you know, the United States, uh, you know, went through a, a very, very similar project uh, you know, for us to exist. Anyway, let me see. Uh, uh, Y'all feel free to jump in the chat with questions. I want to get to this uh, the socialist stuff and labor, but I'm curious uh, what y'all are thinking, so feel free to jump in the, the chat. Um, Neil asks, what's the music used for the intro of Left Reckoning? Um, well, we have, uh, you know, the music we do for, for this one, um, I mean, for, for these are, uh, you know, I just picked them up. It's like cowboy intro or something like that. Um, and uh, the other, the music that we use for the show actually comes from, I'm going to make sure I'm getting uh, uh, one of Matt's good friends. Um, um, here we go. Uh, Christoph Brun, uh, who has a really great, I think we can, we can, uh, Link to it. I think we link to it on the the main show. Um, he's a really great guitarist, and he does the music for our main show as well. Um, here we go. Um, Antonio says Rojava is the only one democracy in the Middle East. Um, when are we going to hear about the Palestinian genocide from Western media? I mean, it's going to take a long while for that. Um, I mean, Dan says, what's my take on the ultra national celebrating at the Western wall? I mean, it's, it's disgusting, but this is like the culminate for, I mean, I'm sure people have seen this image before, um, where you have, you know, Zionists like very much celebrating, um, as they see what pe people thought was burning, the burning of, of the mosque, 
um, but rather was a few trees outside that caught on fire. Um, I mean, this is, you know, that's just to have that level of cruelty um, is is exceptional. But that's that's what happens when you create ideologies, um, you know, based around hate um, like that. I mean, I don't know. There's I mean, the take there is just fucking awful. Um, yeah, it's 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 a really despicable situation. But also remember that. You know, Israel as it exists uh, today. Well, here's a question on that. Um, Israel as it exists today would not be possible without the United States. Would not be possible without the United States uh, funding and protection. Um, because what Israel is doing right now is in clear violation of international law. It's in clear violation of decisions by the United Nations. And uh, the United Nations. Um and, and why it's able to do this is because the United States backs them up. Um, somebody asked, let me make sure I'm getting it. Uh, Robert says, what do you think America's end game is with Israel? Well, it became clear very, very early on in Israel's history, and it's why the, the French, for example, uh, pumped Israel up for a long time was providing them with weapons, that they were a very, very effective um, group uh, to use to prevent any kind of like pan um, Arab movements in in the region, or obviously any movements that would be against U.S. Um, you know power and hegemony. Um, so Israel is an incredibly useful uh, ally for U.S. empire uh, to make sure that in that part of the world uh, nobody gets out of hand. Um, and one of the the things that is really disgusting at this point about it. Um, is that, you know, Israel is, is now, you know, sort of quietly behind the scenes, um, but does, is, is extremely friendly um, with the despotic regime, regimes around, um, around the Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think, you know, more than anything, I mean, that doesn't mean that things are going to let up from the United States, I thought that there was going to be an opening after Obama, um, after Obama and Netanyahu's like feud was just so clear. Um, but it was very quick that, uh, you know, these systems were able to, to re revert themselves. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason that the United States pumps up this, this system is one, because you have like a bunch of evangelical like Looney Tunes um, who very much uh, have like religious preferences there. Um, you know, in the U U.S. Christians who believe that, you know, they need uh, the Jewish people to, you know, control the, the area for the second coming of Christ. <laughs> um, but I think beyond that, the actual more cold, sober analysis that, is that Israel has been a very, very helpful ally at quashing, uh, at squashing any kind of, you know, alternatives in, in the area. Um, Radium says... How, how much do you think politicians' inability to call it Israel comes from fear of being called anti-Semitic versus ideology? I think it's way more ideology than fear. Um, but it is very clear that, uh, you know, the way that the U.S. media um, operates right now, it's very quick. I mean, look what happened with AOC early on. And I think that, by the way, uh, just so we can be clear, AOC's walk back on a lot of her, um, you know, previous support of Palestinian people. And I know like she makes good statements and things like that. But remember when she first uh, got into office, people were excited. Okay, we're finally going to have a voice for Palestinian dignity um, in Congress. And while AOC does a lot and a lot better than most other folks, AOC um, got hit with this very, very early and very, very hard. Remember when she said, well, I'm not an expert in the region. And she essentially started walking back on all of this stuff. Um, I think that was a huge mistake. And I think that this is something on the left um, that should not be something that we treat uh, so, so lightly. Um, and what I mean by that is like standing up for Palestinian people. It shouldn't be something that's like, like, oh, well, this is just, yeah, exactly. This politician isn't perfect, but I guess you can't have perfect politicians, right? I'm not saying everyone needs to be going up um, and being a complete radical on things. Um, but these are things that really any leftist, sh these should be non-negotiable. And I think the quickness um, that, that AOC was sort of able to fall back on that after re receiving, you know, serious backlash. Um, I think that was, I think that that was a shame. Um, and I think it honestly is something that we need to reckon with a little bit more, 
um too you know the consequences again like i always say like aoc is not a member um i mean in any kind of serious material way of like a socialist uh, movement and what i mean by that is like we we worked hard to get her elected um it was an incredible moment of breaking through p power of the democratic party establishment um but you know it's like you shoot her off in space right um i mean that in the sense is like you can't control her once she's like gone into in, into congress at this point and that's a, there's a there's a very serious um breakdown between like the base um here and the the politician um so i think this is just a, a lesson though uh, that you know we shouldn't um you know i mean it's a reality that we're just not going to be able to do what we need to do until we're having people um, in in Congress who are much more rooted in a party organization or in a social organization um, than what we're doing right now. Again, I think it's good to promote left wing uh, candidates and people who share a lot of our, our, our values. Um, but the thing is, like, we don't have the ability to, to recall these folks because we don't have the structures um, that you would need to do that. But we can talk about that um, you know, soon. And like, yeah, and everyone's talking about Yang. I mean, God, he's been, he's been horrific. And AOC's, I mean, and AOC's had some decent statements, you know, since this has started, but I'm talking about over the past couple of years. Um, <laughs> uh, Jay, uh, Jay, Andrew World, I have no idea uh, what planet, I mean, I know what the Hulk is, but I do not know what planet Hulk reference would mean. Um, <sighs> Let me see. Yeah, you know, and uh, p people, and I'm, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, begrudge you. For, I don't know what Plant Hulk stuff is either, y'all. Um, begrudge anyone for it, but I want to not get too distracted with force the vote stuff, um, because actually, there's some other stuff I wanted to get to too. But um, well, let me see. There's a. Uh, I think, you know, we I've talked about this a lot on, on left reckoning is just like until you build that relationship and those structures, um, you know, we effectively like create powerful figures and we hope that they do, you know, what we need them to do. Um, but that's just not going to be uh, the case. Like until you actually have the ability to have like party discipline, um, you know, we can't, you know, it doesn't mean we should be complacent. I'm literally saying we shouldn't be complacent. We should be uh, frustrated. Uh, when AOC was so quick to walk back on, on Israel-Palestine stuff early in her first term. Um, what I'm saying is, like, we also have to understand that that's, like, comes, that's, like, the, that's what comes with the way that we're trying to do politics right now. We're, we're throwing Hail Marys um, because we're trying to build uh, from the ground up political organizations that just have not existed in the United States. Um, and actually, this is a good, uh, you know, kind of move here, is Josh says they've seen the chilling effect in the United Kingdom as well. I mean, seriously remember what happened with jeremy corbyn um labor condemned what israel was doing in the mid in the mildest possible way but now people are calling uh starmer anti-semitic today yeah i mean it's an effective rhetorical tool i mean it's also funny um <clears throat> when you see people who are doing nothing but misleading folks about what's happening what's happening in israel palestine uh basically acting like this is such an academic question that unless you've spent like the past you know four years of your life uh, studying the Middle East, uh, then you can't have an opinion on something. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, the, the only reason you fall into arguments like that is when what is happening is so extremely clear uh, that you have to come up with some kind of like gatekeeping <laughs> uh, scenario to have a conversation about this. Um, uh, J. Andrew World is talking about the Hulk. I can't do this shit right now, brother. I love you. Um, <laughs> Um, all right, well, let me see. I want to, okay, I want to talk a, a little bit about, and this goes into, there's, you know, it's not a neat bridge, but it's a, it's an okay, it's a decent enough one for now. Um, I want to talk about the title of this video, which is what happens when, when socialists, uh, fail labor. And, and I bring this up, um, because I just think it's just such an absurd example of, well, let, let me start here, actually. Let's start um, with the fight and get to this kind of stupid, uh, what, you know, like anti-worker 
whatever the hell that means, anti-worker uh, socialist organization out there. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, Cuse is talking about the, the anti-Semitism stuff in labor and the accusations against the court. I mean, I'm, do you all remember when that report came out? Um, it was it was pretty nasty. But let's get over this because this is, this is a crazy story. We've talked about it a little bit. Um, but this ongoing strike... Um, this ongoing strike in Alabama now um, has been getting, ex- oh, come on, um, here we go. I'm still learning this like platform. Okay, here we go. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar, we've been talking about this a lot on the show, um, but workers, 1,100 uh, mine workers have been on strike since April now. Um, fighting for for better conditions, and they have, you know, in fact, uh, rejected a contract that was negotiated. Um, you know, they're they're preparing for the long haul. It's a hard fight. Um, the scabs have been some of the reports I've seen from folks like Kim Kelly have been incredible um, about the kind of behavior that the, the scabs um, have been been up to trying to break this strike. But I want to bring up this story because it's it's really wild. Um, Alabama coal mine seems to be leaking pollution while its workers are on strike. And they go through this example um, that, you know, basically people in the know believe that since the workers have have been on strike, the scabs and the company itself have been, uh, you know, dumping pollutants into local water sources. Um, It's it's absolutely uh, horrific. and it goes with a lot of really nasty stuff that the, the scabs have been up to so far. Um, but I want to read this quote right here. Um, I don't think we know the details. This is coming from um, the uh, communications director for United Mine Workers of America. And, of course, they're being cautious up front. But they say, I don't think we know the details of what happened here yet completely. So it's kind of hard to point a finger and say this is what happened and who's responsible. But I do know that when the normal workforce is working in that mine, you don't see these sorts of things happening. These things don't happen so much when the UMWA workforce is in these mines. Um, and this is just an incredible story of, of their attempts to do strike breaking. Um, not only have there, has there been a, you know, a focus on um, harassing you know, the workers, obviously, at the picket line and even in their own homes, um, uh, you know, but this kind of wanton disregard for the environment and the community around them it's it's something else and it's it's quite disgusting um so solidarity with uh you know with that fight and i wanted to uh, lean in a little bit um find some more ways to shout this out um but you know all of our our comrades at the valley labor report have been covering this really well um let me pull this back for you all um definitely check out this opportunity um i'm sort of doing this on the fly so i, I think there's other ways to donate too um but they're doing, if you're in the Alabama area, there is a uh, fundraiser going on this uh, weekend, I believe. Um, I think there's also a way to you know, donate uh, through YouTube and to watch virtually as well. Uh, but pretty exciting. Alabama Strike Fest uh, benefit concert and marathon, marathon fundraising live stream. Um, so definitely check that out, all of y'all. Um, and solidarity to our friends over there um, in Alabama and also at the Valley Labor Report. But... I wanted to talk about this other aspect here. Okay, I'm figuring out the audio, y'all. I'm sorry about that. Um, I want to do one more thing. I'm still learning how to do this while we're live, so (laughs) forgive me. Um, Okay, here we go. I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, so this is Jacob here. Actually, I'll put my audio back up since I've been saying this low. Um, this is Jacob here. And well, let me give you all a little context. Uh, the World Socialist website is a bizarre organization. We'll talk a little bit about them in a second. Um, but specifically, the grievance here is that they showed up um, and, and did a bunch of reports on the workers um, who were you know, in this strike. And they just completely misrepresented them. In such a way um, that the the striking workers became furious, 
with this organization. Basically, what the World Socialist website was trying to do um, was pit uh, the striking workers against the national union, right? Um, and, and we'll get into why that they have this just honestly bizarre um, uh, anti-labor union ideology, uh, though they did not come with it up on their own. It has an unfortunate precedent. Um, but I want to bring this up because this shows exactly what can happen. Like we, like we have disagreements with folks, um, but this is why these disagreements can be really important because they hurt us in the long run. This can't be just like your fun little click. This can't just be, um, you know, a fun little social club for you to get into, to paint yourself in your favorite revolutionary color um, and pit yourself against other people so that maybe one day you can win the argument, right? This is life and death shit for people. We're trying to, you know, fight for a, a working class uh, across the globe that has the boot of capital on their fucking neck. Um, and you want to come in here and, and create chaos and discord and, and distrust. It's disgusting. Anyways, let's read the tweet so we can get into the broader stuff. Uh, Jacob says, man, the wreckers at World Socialist website um, and the SCP Socialist Equality Party have really soured rank and file mine workers on socialism. And it's pissing me off. Me too, brother. Every time I talk to someone from there now about something or another, they're like, is this a socialist thing? Those folks from the WSWS. It's a shame because they have absolutely no following. Talking about the, the World Socialist website. Um, they have absolutely no following, no membership, no rank and file support, nothing close to real socialist groups like the Democratic Socialists of America or the Party of Socialism and Liberation, Socialist Alternative. Um, and they have defined socialism to hundreds of minor, minors now through their rampant attacks on the union. <clears throat> Again, I just told you all basically what happened there. Um, but this is, it's unacceptable the shit that these guys get into because I want to, to highlight two things that Jacob put, puts on here that are really, really important. One, this is like not even an organization in a sense, um, other than a kind of like loose online collective. This is not a rank and file organization. This is not an organization that has mass membership. This is not an organization that really functionally participates in politics in a meaningful way. Um, this is a group of people who are very, very much attracted and attached um, to like the most negative reading of, of Leon Trotsky, um, the most conspiratorial view of anyone else who's doing politics, um, and you know a, a very, very misplaced, uh, diagnosis and um, attack on American labor unions. Um, and let me just put the cards on the table on this one. It's, I don't want I'm going to piss some people off with this, but there are plenty of criticisms that you can make about the way that American labor organizations are run. There is a historical development the way that American labor organizations developed, right? And there are serious problems if you look at the history of the decoupling of like generalized working class uh, struggle, class struggle in the largest sense, um, and, and socialist politics from the American labor movement. And that was very much a project of, of anti-socialists who, um, you know, who were both working within and out of, of labor uh, unions in the early 20th century, right? Like there are historical critiques. There are political critiques you can make of, of the labor, uh, you know, of labor unions, right? I might disagree with you on a lot of those, but, you know, there's, there's fair game and then there's whatever the hell these guys are doing um, at the World Socialist website because the World Socialist website is not putting forward a political alternative. This is not criticizing uh, with the intention of making things stronger. This functionally is not even criticizing with the intention of like educating working people. This is criticism with the intention of being a wrecker and trying to squash um, labor militancy in the United States. Um, and I think, I think functionally it's because of, of a LARPers and a pretender's desire uh, to be on the right side of history. And knowing the way that the, the deck is stacked against working people in this country, it's a lot easier to be a naysayer than a supporter. Um, <laughs> um, Patrick says, uh, breaking news uh, from Ryan Knight, the Dems are beholden to capital. Details still coming, but it sounds like they are corrupt in neo-lib neo -lib sellouts. Look, yeah, and there's a, there's a um, I mean, yeah, I mean, oh, God, I forgot that Ryan had uh, the these guys on their show. You know, it's 
you can't be a, a, a socialist without um, really trying to work to build a mass party and a mass uh, political organization. Like the goal of socialism is not just like, oh, I like these policies. Is that I believe that if we empower working people, uh, we can change the world. And I know ostensibly, I mean, they call themselves socialists, you know, uh, these folks at WSWS. Um, I know ostensibly they say that that's what they believe, right? But they the way that they're going f forward with this is by creating a, a small group of online uh, Twitter trolls. Um, the way that they're doing this is by uh, harassing and misrepresenting striking workers so much so that now in the future, whenever uh, anybody tries to talk to those working people about socialism or organizing, um, you know, with, with our, our kind of politics, their immediate reaction is distrust because a bunch of jackasses went um, and want to play Trotsky in 2021, right? And uh, fuck, for fuck's sake, you're not even playing Trotsky. You're just being a, a, a wrecker. Um, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're really hurting folks. You're really hurting folks. And not just, oh, my feelings are hurt or I'm sad. You are preventing us from building the kind of organizations uh, that are necessary to emancipate working people. And I'm starting to have a little bit less patience um, for, for this kind of shit. Just knowing how much, how the difficult situation that we are in. But despite that, people are willing to put it all on the line and to fight for their lives for better wages. Right. And you're going to sit here and, and misrepresent them because because, again, like just so we're all clear, if people aren't familiar with this story, what the World Socialist website, what these organizations argue for is they are against American labor unions. So they want to see a splinter. They want all of the workers, um, you know, who are who are on strike to say we break from the labor aristocracy and are creating our own uh, different kind of, of union. Right. This is what the World Socialist um website is doing here is they're trying to fit ongoing conditions into a prefab theory that they have um, for what needs to happen, right? Which is, which means they have no confidence in their ability to organize the World Social website, folks. Um, they have no confidence in their ability to do this then if they are trying to misrepresent the things that working people are saying, right? Because there was a break. Um, you know, they, the, these workers, they, they said no to the contract that was negotiated for them, right? I'm just saying, like, let's say, like, I'm on, like, the WS, whatever their, their sign on this one, right? You're seeing some development here, right? And instead of, you know, being friendly and showing people solidarity and supporting them, um, you're putting words in their mouth to try to create a conflict where the workers didn't want this conflict. They didn't want that conflict um, with the rest of the union. It's just... It's 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 disgusting um, as as you know as as socialists to see people do this. Um, it's it's the complete opposite of showing solidarity. Um, it's 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 wrecker shit. It's and it's it's wrecker stuff and it's larper stuff. And I bring this up um, to uh, you know remind people that the stakes are real. Like you know even small organizations like this can have serious um, effects. You know in the negative direction. Uh, to building socialist politics. So we need to take these things seriously. And you can't just ignore, um, you know, the wackos out there. And you certainly uh, shouldn't bolster them. Uh, you should present them as exactly what they are, pretenders and people who at any, ch at, you know, given the chance, given the opportunity, will stab workers in the back uh, to benefit a narrative that they want to put forward rather um, than, than standing with working people and listening to them um, and organizing around those conditions. Um, and justice, there's, there's, you know, there, I, I don't know, like, I, I think the, people are talking about the, uh, the Trant stuff and like, yeah, I mean, there's a whole history there and, and whatever. Um, yeah, literally taking bread off people's table for a LARP. Uh, Ronnie says support BDS. Thanks for your work. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Somebody is asking the Trotsky stuff because they're uh, someone says, "Hey, David, for the Social Democrats, uh, what do you mean by channeling Trotsky?" Not a hundred percent. Oh, okay, I get it. What do you mean by channeling Trotsky? Um, these these organizations are are, are Trotskyist, um, 
And the Trotsky stuff, I think, gets uh, a little confused. And I'd like to start doing more uh, stuff about those thinkers and what they sort of represent. But when most people talk about Trots, um, what they mean um, is a kind of socialist tendency um, to think that the big organizations, right, um, represent some kind of, you know, corruption of the working movement. Um, so therefore, like, you need to push forward splintering to get the true and, and, and the just and the correct cadre of communists and socialists, right? Um, and, like, I, the reason I was saying channeling and I said not even well, is because at least with Trotsky, there's some, you know, like, there's historical um, basis for that. I think... Um, uh, I'll, we'll talk about all that stuff later about Trotsky as an actual historical figure, but... Um, what people mean by, uh, you know, being a trance is like essentially being a wrecker and why the orientation um, is because there's a mistrust of any of the big organizations. So you need to splinter off the correct group, um, you know, the true, just, real working people, the real communists from the fake communists. Um, and historically, in this, and America has a great tendency for this, um, like a great track record with this. I mean, that you know, in a, in a fucked up sense, ironic sense. Um you know, one, the, the, the CIA and FBI very much um, utilize the tendency of Trotskyists to split. Um, I know Ben Burgess actually has, a, you know, some really funny stories. Um, and can sort of take you through the genealogy of different American, like, social outfits out there. Um, and you can take them back, like, 15 splits, right? Like, Trotskyists, like, the joke is, like, they're always just splitting up um, into, like, four or five different splinter parties. Um, and, you know, the DSA has its own ideological questions and, and things historically that you have to deal with. Um, but the hope of the DSA was to, to be an organization that sort of broke from that, that different history. Um, thanks, Robert, for the, uh, the support. Um, and Tony says, what, wasn't Christopher Hitchens a Trotskyist? Uh, yeah, he was a big supporter of uh, Trotsky. Um, uh, actually, in his early years. And uh, sort of an interesting history, too. Uh, with Trotz and uh, and the um, uh, U.S. Uh, State Department, but that's a whole other thing. But again, it's like the reason I, 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 I the only reason I might have seemed like I was being hesitant about talking about Trotsky um, and and Trotz is because I think it's like it's a term that's used so broadly um, that it actually like uh, it, it 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 captures into too many people and it obviously extremely obscures uh leon trotsky as a thinker and a, and, and a, a communist and um you know and a lot of other folks who have been inspired by by trotsky as well i don't like painting with too large of a brush because there's this very funny american um and uh, in uk too i know um <laughs> like system of of, of trotskyism that's always just breaking up with itself um and God, y'all, I mean, what happened in the UK over the weekend was just devastating. Um, just absolutely. Western Trotskyism was just anti-USSR, sorry, but they were also anti, um, you know, any big socialist organizations because they said that any, any socialist organization essentially is a front for the USSR. Um, you know, and Stalinism. Um yeah, the losses in the UK, I mean, the Labour Party has just been completely taken over at this point. Uh, not that it wasn't completely infected with, you know, Blairism and third row. You know, I, I tweeted it out and it was like I said that the Labour Party, you know, the point of getting rid of Corbyn uh, was never about winning elections or even making people's lives better. Is making sure that British millionaires and the elite knew that the Labour Party uh, was a safe organization to um, for them to be members of, and that they were under no threat of that. All right, y'all. Um, let me see. Unless anyone has any uh, more questions. Um, <clears throat> on uh, on um, Thursday, we have Matt Huber on to talk about uh, to talk about how the rich um, really are responsible uh, for the majority of the world's uh, pollution and how thinking about these things as like individual consumption choices, even for the rich and famous. Um, is not helpful. Uh, we should think about these as power relations and the people who benefit directly um, from extreme extraction and and, and carbon pollution uh, should be the targets of our ear. I'm really looking forward uh, to that conversation. For folks, um, 
you know, <laughs> um, Jeffrey says, I, I went to some meeting with Tronskyists from Fight Back. I'm not familiar with them. And they seem like LARPers um, inundating me with badly written articles, essentially calling all other leftist traitors. Yeah, I mean, that's like that's a classic kind of um, almost comical example on this kind of stuff. But I will say I have a, I have a, a, a twisted love of those denunciation essays. Um, there's a group here in Austin called the Austin Red Guards, which honestly does some pretty frightening stuff. And I, they've harassed the essay members. When I talk to normies, you know, like family members about them, um, they know them as this group that keeps on littering the city with dead pig's head um, and stuff like that. Anyway, it's a pretty wacky group, but they write these incredible just takedown essays. I mean, they're completely nuts, the political content, but I do... Uh, you know, as somebody who writes from time to time, I do appreciate somebody who can just put out like a 15 page rant uh, against a, like a cat cafe that they don't like. Um, um, but for folks who aren't patrons, you should definitely consider joining us at patreon.com slash left reckoning. And for all the people who, um, who are patrons, we really appreciate that. Uh, we're starting to get some growth. I would really like to be able to um, hit a thousand patrons soon. We're trying to bring in um, some more people on the team and having opportunities to expand what we're able to do uh, would be really great. I mean, Matt and I have some big hopes. I'd like, I'd like eventually if we're able to get the the funding and apparatus um, to have this show be very, very mobile um, and have us being able to go uh, to places like Iowa and Alabama and across Texas and, and the South and Midwest and, you know, wherever we can go, honestly, I'd love to go internationally too. Um, but I think that there's a, you know, a lot of opportunities out there for us um, to re be doing some more on the ground reporting and like short documentaries about labor struggles um, out around the country. Uh, but that's a little bit more of a long term uh, stretch goal. Um, but yeah, you know, definitely consider uh, uh, joining us there to support that work. And for folks who are not um, uh, already patrons, um, we will be premiering our conversation uh, with that we had uh, with Paul O'Connell about the Irish radical James Connolly tomorrow afternoon, I believe almost immediately after Matt finishes up majority report. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be uh, definitely check that out. Um, but if you're a Patreon, you can get that as well. Um, Kowalski says, uh, would, would you and Matt like a Kowalski family farm t-shirt? Oh, we'd absolutely love, I would definitely love that. That'd be great, man. Also, Check out Prairie Fire, folks, if you haven't already. I've been uh, binging all the videos. I mean, they're short and digestible, uh, but I like them a lot. Honestly, they're very fun um, and interesting, too. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you all, uh, I'll see you all on Thursday. Uh, Thursday at 8, we'll be talking with Matt, and uh, we'll also be releasing something on Sunday as well, uh, too. We're sort of working on our guest uh, for the patrons-only show. Anyways, uh, take care, everybody.